This is DeSalony and welcome to episode 27 of 90s Overlooked Underheard. Thanks for joining me again. Yeah, um, today we're going to be looking at uh, two albums from the second half of 1997, um, both uh, by artists from the US specifically. And uh, this is a kind of a little shout out to subscriber Mike here, both from Louisville. Um, yeah, Mike, they're both from your neck of the woods. Yeah, and first up today, we have, as performed by Ariel N, by Ariel N, released on the 25th of August, 1997. So if you weren't aware, Ariel M is the solo project of David Pajo. Um, yeah, David being most well known as a member of Slint. He was one of the two guitarists in that band, alongside uh, singer-guitarist Brian McMahon. Yeah, David is kind of a bit of a musical uh, nomad uh, since his Slint days. He's played, contributed uh, to many, many, many other artists' work. Um, an exhaustive list would be difficult, but he has played with Will Oldham uh, in the Palace Brothers. Yeah, Will Oldham, uh, friends with the band. And uh, yeah, he's the guy responsible for that photo of them uh, in the water on the Spiderland album. Yeah, David played with Tortoise, uh, circa the kind of Millions Now Living Will Never Die album. Yeah, David also teamed up with that slint bandmate Brian again uh, in The Four Carnation on that band's first EP, Fight Songs. And it doesn't stop there yet. Of course, he played in the kind of reunited slint lineup. They did uh, a, a whole bunch of touring uh, during the mid noughties um, I think the last time they played together live was about 2013. And along with those, yeah, he's he's uh, well known for kind of filling in or, you know, stepping in to kind of uh, play for kind of missing members or just supplementing uh, the lineup of certain bands for, you know, gigs and live work. He's played with Interpol, uh, the Yeah, Yeah, Yeah's, uh, Stereo Lab even. And uh, I understand uh, this year coming in 2023, He's due to be touring as a guitarist for Gang of Four. But yeah, M is David's kind of solo alter ego, uh, which is he normally refers to himself as either Ariel M in this case, or more often, as it turned out, uh, Papa M. Yeah, here's a whole bunch of uh, David's stuff as that kind of Papa M alter ego. Several albums here. Life from a Shark Cage, Papa M Sings, and Hole of Burning Arms. But yeah, as performed by it was uh, David's first full length solo release um, following a couple of yeah, uh, single releases. And uh, yeah, this one is entirely instrumental. As I mentioned, he, he's done other stuff as Papa M. And in some of those uh, albums, uh, he does sing uh, slightly more kind of folky country inflected material. But this album is entirely instrumental. So yeah, before I uh, carry on telling you about some of the key tracks on this, uh, just to kind of uh, let you know, this is a very brief uh, release. I, I recently did a rundown of um, albums that were around about the 30 minute mark or so, and this one just clocks in at just over half an hour. I, I would have put it on that list if I hadn't had it lined up to talk about today. But yeah, despite its short runtime, I don't think you could possibly hope to hear a more satisfying, kind of coherent and inventive album deliver quite so much with such a kind of a a focused kind of economy and brevity anywhere else. So the opening track, Dazed and Awake, features this kind of pair of circling, very gently plucked clean guitar lines that kind of weave in and out of one another over this very simple, sustained, pulsing, almost single note bass line with this very, very metronomic, again, very simple drum pattern. This kind of warbling kind of vibrato, uh, sounds like a Leslie possibly, a uh, guitar line kind of nudges in and it kind of slides around in the midst of the main melody, doing kind of interesting little things. You know, the bass line occasionally just breaks free and kind of ascends and then descends back to that single pulsing note. Yeah, this is just a blissfully kind of calm and clear headed mood piece. Yeah, very beautiful, very restrained start to the album. The album's second track is As. Um, and yeah, excuse me for this one while I just kind of go off on one a bit. I think so much art, you know, painting, some some writing, that kind of thing, is is always very clearly about, you know, a single voice or a single vision, you know, executing something in isolation. And you could argue that an album like this, where David recorded, played everything, that exactly the same thing would apply. But I think this track just cracks that whole kind of idea wide open. 
what happens here for me is that David's guitar playing almost kind of takes on a very strange performative aspect. It feels almost like he's adopting different characters. It's like if you watch a really cool ventriloquist or a puppeteer or even a stand up comic who's really good, who will maybe, you know, take on the voice of a different character to kind of get his point across, to, to, to make a joke, to, to, to kind of animate something uh, more fully. Yeah, it kind of turns into a kind of a storytelling. And this track is one where I get the feeling that the two guitar lines, the different parts, the way that they work, the way they interlock, they're almost like completely different characters talking to one another. Yeah, I mean, near the beginning, it, it almost sounds like like bird song. It's it's like a call and response. And although these these pieces that are being played are different, the patterns, the melodies, it sounds like they both mean something. They dovetail together in a kind of completely natural way. This is a, a wonderful, wonderful piece of music. It's kind of dreamy and contemplative, but uh, but very patient and very playful. Yeah, this is just very, very patient, very sure-footed music. Um, and it just feels like there's not an excess note in sight anywhere. Yeah, the track Wedding Song number two, uh, it sounds exactly like the title. It's just these gently kind of crisscrossing picked guitar patterns. And it really kind of captures the feel of some delicate kind of graceful, almost like a courtship dance. It's very kind of slight track, but it's very pretty. Yeah, Scrag theme, I think, is the one track here that kind of approximates that kind of shadowy, slightly disconcerting feeling of, you know, some of Spiderland's moments. Maybe maybe a track like Don, A Man. Yeah, this simple, very repetitive riff uh, cycles and cycles throughout with these little guitar harmonics kind of flickering and refracting off that melody in the background. You get these odd little waves of kind of almost kind of Eno-esque synth or, or, or keyboards that fade in and out. And yeah, those, again, simple drums, they seem to snap at the heels of the melody. This There's a tension being hinted at in there somewhere, kind of on the periphery of the scene that Pajot is painting here. Yeah, crucially, I think for this track, there's a switch in the mood. It feels different, but the tone, yeah, it feels the same. Um, the calmness is there, but there's this kind of hint of anxiety creeping in and chipping away at the edge. I'm following the track with some kind of reversed tape ambience, which is called uh, Compassion for M. Uh, the album closes with Always Farewell. And I think this one may be a little like Scrag theme, but not so much. You get the vaguest hints of this kind of minor key kind of menace intruding. Uh, again, it's the, it comes through those those odd keyboards that he kind of starts to fade and layer in there. But here, back to that kind of lilting guitar line that forms the basis of this track, it just laps like waves. And there's this almost kind of comforting tolling of a bell. You know, it sounds like, you know, something at a harbour or, or a church. And it kind of hints at the idea of, of safety, of calmness again. Yeah, this album is just very, very graceful. Um, it's got a lot of poise in amongst the simplicity of what he's doing. And um, yeah, I think it's a fantastic record. So on today to our second record and uh, yeah, more Louis Villiers, um, if that's the right word, I think it is. Um, yeah, the album we're looking at second today is Save Everything by Shipping News released on the 23rd of September, 1997. So yeah, Shipping News was initially, uh, you know, started as a, a, a duo, a project to just kind of compose uh, some soundtrack work, some commission for an NPR uh, radio program. Um, and that duo was uh, Jason Noble and Jeff Muller, who both played in the amazing band Rodan uh, a, a year or so previously to the release of this album. Yeah, if you're not familiar with Rodan, uh, they had one album, which is really essential listening i think and that is rusty so uh please feel free to go and check that out shortly after this they became a three-piece uh full band for the first time and um they were joined by kyle crabtree on drums uh this is all about 96 again so as in rodan uh yeah uh jason and and jeff kind of split vocal duties uh, where there were vocals uh, some of their music was instrumental 
And occasionally they, they did kind of trade uh, guitar and bass. You see this if you see some live videos of them. But essentially, uh, Jason was playing bass on this album and uh, Jeff was playing guitar. Yeah, in parallel to uh, shipping news, uh, both Jeff and Jason were also kind of pulling time in a couple of other bands. Uh, I may have mentioned a few of them previously on, on during this series. Um, uh, Jeff Muller was was part of Juno 44 alongside, you know, people like Fred Erskine and Doug Sharon, Shaw Meadows. Um, but Jason was also playing in the Sonora Pine and uh, the wonderful Rachel's, this kind of chamber music. I hate to use the word post-rock, but yeah, post-rock kind of uh, ensemble. But yes, this album, uh, Save Everything, was the band's, you know, debut full length release. Um, uh, only six tracks, but yeah, it does clock in at almost 40 minutes. Yeah, the band did release uh, several further albums. You know, here's a few of them here um, during the time that they were active and recording. Um, the one I don't have here is their final album, which is um, 2010's One Less Heartless to Fear. Um, and this was recorded shortly following uh, Jason Noble's uh, diagnosis with a, a very rare form of cancer in the previous year, um, a kind of cancer which affected the connective tissues. Yeah, Jason uh, underwent much treatment for this uh, cancer. Some of it was, I understand, quite experimental. Um, there was a crowdfunder to kind of get some money together for him. Um, I am wearing one of the t-shirts of that crowdfunder, a Rodan Moth shirt. These are still available. I'll put a link uh, down below. Uh, all proceeds do go to Jason's family. But yes, um, yeah, following two years of treatment, um, Jason did lose his life to the disease um, and died in early August 2012. Um, yeah, and he was only 40 years old. Uh, yeah, a very, very terrible, very sad loss of an extremely talented and a friendly young guy who left the legacy of a lot of great music for us to kind of um, enjoy over the years. Yeah, I can't say I, I, I knew the knew the guys uh, personally, but um, I did bump into them uh, on Rodan's uh, 1994 tour, I believe it was, um, just at the venue and, and kind of had a chat with them. And yeah, Jason, Jeff, they, they were both just, you know, at that time, just really enthusiastic young guys on tour in the UK for the first time. Um, just lovely people. Anyway, um, I'm diverting away a little. Let's get back to Save Everything and talk about some key tracks. But first of all, um, just very, very quickly, just to draw some parallels between, you know, David Paggio and, and Shipping News. Both artists were, you know, very definitely kind of post-hardcore rooted. They came up through that scene. But I think where, where David kind of leaned in a maybe slightly more kind of uh, pastoral kind of traditional, maybe a slightly folky direction, certainly on a lot of his material, um, Shipping News tilted in a different direction. They definitely skewed to a more kind of a, a, a neoclassical style, if you like. Yeah, so the opening track on uh, Save Everything is uh, Books on Trains. It features this kind of snaky, twisty bass line um, being you know, pierced forcefully by this kind of screed of kind of feedbacking, you know, that thing where you hit a, like, a weird semitone interval and you just get that horrible atonal noise. That lovely, horrible atonal noise. Yeah, Jeff Muller was kind of pushing that through this song. But that, that kind of noise it evolves. It takes on this kind of stabbing, kind of repeating pattern over the same bass line um, with no, Noble's vocals uh, coming in, you know, distorted, semi-yelled. And it continues this way until the song's coda, where it kind of coalesces into this kind of repetitive, subtly kind of uh, weaving bass and guitar melody. And, and Kyle's drums really kind of, you know, work off them at this point in the song. Yeah, it's very rich music, full of complex melodies and structures and time signatures, just straight from the off. You know, it's still identifiably kind of post-hardcore, but um, you feel that obvious connection between the players. You know, it beams out of the music. You know, this is music born of like some kind of kinship and collaboration. And, you know, this is one of those things where, you know, post-rock tends to get conflated with prog rock sometimes. And with prog rock, I think you get this kind of odd kind of competitive almost showiness sometimes and this is a million miles from that it clearly grew from people who were of the punk rock kind of scene 
And I think maybe that's what differentiates what we would call post-rock with prog, is that kind of punk rock ethic, that openness, that collaborativeness, that just need to kind of get on and do the right thing for the song. I think that's what kind of defines it. Yeah, that's my take on that. I, I, I don't know. Either way, this is a killer opening track. Uh, track two, Steerage, is really a song of two halves. Uh, the first is this kind of fidgety riff, you know, which is grounded by this kind of slightly dubby bass line from Jason. Uh, and Jeff's vocals are this kind of semi-spoken, -spoke, um, kind of yelled, hoarse, hectoring, kind of restless uh, lyrics. But then about kind of three minutes in, I think, um, you start to hear these kind of found sounds, these kind of tapes, these environmental kind of tapes start to fade in and the song shifts, it slows into this simple kind of plucked repeating guitar rift. You get kind of train noise, um, all the instruments get kind of hazy and loose, um, little harmonics enter, uh, very impressionistic um, and the lyrics kind of pivot into this, you know, kind of spoken, kind of beat poetry style, just kind of very subdued, very subliminal, all kind of tape hiss and kind of, you know, shadowy intent. Yeah, this is a very, very cool track. And you see this kind of looser, kind of more, you know, impressionistic style appear again on side two's uh, At A Venture. But in this instance, we get a female voice entering, uh, speaking in French, while this kind of, you know, stringy kind of taut slide guitar um, gives way to these kind of echoing hollow, almost kind of weird tones like gamelan somewhere in the background, like bells. Um, yeah, it's it's beautiful. And lastly, um, the album's closing track, uh, A True Lover's Knot, which like steerage uh, clocks in uh, at a little over 10 minutes. Yeah, the first two minutes or so of this track are, are Jason singing into what sounds like, you know, a dictaphone. There's lots of crackle and tape hiss here. Um, he sings, uh, a true lover's knot can never break. Yeah, but this part of the song is just a prelude to the rest with the band's kind of neoclassical, if you like, stylings really take full flight just after the two minute mark. Yeah, these ringing arpeggios interlock beautifully with the bass, uh, pushing new parts to the fore. You get melodic motifs kind of sinking and then rising back to the surface. Yeah, it's an absolutely spellbinding piece of instrumental music. Um, you know, plateaus, rises, falls. Um, there's this kind of fiery, sparking kind of conclusion where, you know, it feels like the band are coming back to this kind of more traditional kind of riffing, kind of post-hardcore mode. Um, yeah, very distorted kind of offbeat time signatures, like these vertiginous little kind of stop start sections but again they bring it back again these kind of melodic motifs from earlier in the song they resurface and you get this much more peaceful kind of chiming resolution yeah this is one of those tracks that's just so good it almost hurts to talk about it it's this is one of my favorite pieces of music of the 1990s and over the course of their albums shipping news delivered highs just as high as they managed on this record but yeah for some reason this one just keeps keeps pulling me back and i think it's that track it's a true lover's knot um i think it's a masterpiece okay there we go two more down and we're getting closer to the end of the decade um i hope you've enjoyed this episode and uh if you have then please feel free to show your appreciation any way you like but in the meantime uh take care and i hope you'll join me again soon for another episode of 90s overlooked Underhood. Bye for now.